Dr. Dan, my brother. Brother. How you doing? So good. We dropped in, and it was about a year ago, and in our time, that's a long time. Lots of shit happens in a year. <laughs> we're not the same people that we were <laughs> a year ago. a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the consistent themes between both of us is that you know, we'll take the time to do a ceremony, do a ritual, add on a software package or some other thing to you know, kind of guide us towards a different path. And we're consistently doing that. So when we catch up, it's like, hey, what have you been doing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know yeah. and I'm like, hey, this show, is what I've been show doing. your notebook. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So you've been pretty deep in one of the areas I wanted to talk about. You've been pretty deep in, um, in a community that mm. you've been living and kind of exploring that, you know, alternative social construct of like how you could organize yourself in a community and doing some research with that community in Portugal. And so why don't you bring us up to speed on that, mm -hmm. on that software package you've been awesome. playing with. Didn't expect to talk about that. Uh, yeah, I why not? <laughs> Who knows? I didn't know either. It just came out. I love it. And it's also super timely because since I left Austin, that's essentially what I went to go do. Right. And uh, the community that I dropped in with, it's a small little micro village ecosystem of sorts, eight adults, four kids, a couple of acres, garden, growing our own food, and working with the social infrastructure to explore the dynamics of a multi-relational system. And what I mean by multi-relational is my partner has another partner, and that man has a wife, and she has a boyfriend, and he has a wife, that they're separating, and we all live in the same household. So mm -hmm. with all of these multi-relational styles and dynamics in a fairly closed, well, not closed, but close-knit circle, um, it, there's a lot of opportunity for friction. There's a lot of opportunity for growth and celebration and juice and fun and play, and there's a lot of opportunity for friction. Sure. Unless we have the clear communication styles going on, unless we have the clear, um, consistent commitment for everybody showing up to do the work together, to vision into the community what we're desiring to create. And that's like the forward thinking and the backstory and the, and the stuff behind the curtains is all of the withholds and the challenges and the unmet needs and maybe not even unrecognized needs and desires and fantasies and hurts and all this stuff from the, from the backstory. And it was a phenomenally rich, really challenging, beautiful experiment uh, yeah when i talk to people about the open relationship container that i've explored which is you know absent of that you know full community and the dynamics of everybody living together but it's still you have to want to lean into the challenge of that you know it's going to force you to communicate better it's going to force you to deal with issues of your ego it's going to force you to deal with fears, insecurities, all these things. If you don't want the practice of using resistance to make you better, stay the fuck out of non-traditional relationships. Like you have to know that, oh, I'm going into yeah. resistance training for my emotions, my psyche, my communication, you know, my heart, everything. Right. And you and you have to welcome that as part of the practice. It's like if you don't want to sweat, don't go to the gym. Exactly. You know, so for you, that's you've gone like straight into the you know, emotional pressure cooker where it demands a certain impeccability. Yeah. And it, I didn't know consciously that I was choosing that. Uh, and as I opted into the system and, and you and I have, we've shared a lot of conversations and a lot of ceremonies and we've both been down the rabbit hole pretty deep with our yeah, own. a few times. <laughs> <laughs> and a few times more to come. Yeah. We've been in the midst of, growing our own um, resilience, our own fullness, our own wholesome experience internally and externally. And yet there's, there's the stuff that gets worked when it's on the surface, when it's here and present. And so I didn't know that I was carrying around a lot of challenge in intimacy until I was in the pressure cooker of that, mm -hmm. that container. Yeah, it's like cere system. ceremony I've always likened like sparring. Ceremony is kind of sparring. Some part of you knows that you're working with these issues, but it's it's going to be over. Like the, the medicine's going to wear off, the dieta is going to wear off. You're going to you deal with those slightly in a in a playground setting. The not that they don't feel real, not that they aren't real, 
but like dealing with your death in ceremony versus having testicular cancer like i was talking to lance armstrong about where the doctors gave him a pretty good chance to die mm. like one there's different levels you know and it's the same as like yeah i was working on my ego in ceremony versus yeah i heard my the love of my life fucking somebody else in the next room <laughs> like, <laughs> like those are two different those are two different animals right entirely entirely and we we don't ever know how we're really going to show up <laughs> right. when that thing happens yep. So there's one way to know, and I get consistently curious, and this is where you and I oftentimes have a lot of resonance in our conversations. I get really curious about what my growth edges are. Mm -hmm. And if my growth edges are in the physical arena, then great, what's that physical resistance training? If they're in the emotional, if they're in the psychic, if they're in the spiritual, what what's that playground where I can really maximize my time and effort to grow in the most complete version of myself as possible? So I get curious about what my weaknesses are, those those sticky points, those challenges, those pressure points. It's not necessarily comfortable. And is, this last year in uh, many ways has been the biggest ass kicker on a level of emotion and intimacy and that degree of connectivity because I'm, I'm fairly, historically, particularly over the last 10 years since working with so much with the medicines, I'm fairly um, a hermit yeah. in many capacities. And so to opt well, in. Well, nomad, hermit, somewhere yeah. in between. <laughs> nomad, hermit, no, monk. No mermit. Yeah, <laughs> no mermit. A we her, have to clone. A hermad. <laughs> a hermad. I like the hermad. Hermad is okay. probably the way That the started way here. Yeah. So I've been a hermad for, you know, a decade. <laughs> and then over the last year, I'm like in, in this like magnifying glass of intensity. Yeah. And it was the consistency of showing up in our, in our, we, for a while it was once a week and then went to a twice a week forum style sharing we were getting everything out on the on the table with the whole community. And so there's eight of us. Everybody opts in twice a week. And for the first couple of months, I actually had a lot of trigger when my lady was connecting with her other partner. And I, I love her, and she's rad, and I love him, and he's rad. And the two of them would get together on their date nights, and it wasn't even like at, that it was in front of me, but I just knew that that's what was going on. Sure. And I had this crazy trigger that whole day leading up and the whole next day, I was just like, I don't want to see either one of you. I'm not sure why. <laughs> you're still both cool. I'm glad you're connecting, but I got something happening. Yeah. And uh, it was through this master level NLP practitioner who just like is this Jedi for emotional intelligence helped me rewire all of this to earliest stuff and all of my abandonment stuff that I didn't even, after 400 or so ceremonies, I had still not cracked that level of it yep. because it had not come up to the surface. I wasn't sparring yet in that kind of arena. Mm -hmm. And so then with it up, I can get around it and I can work through it. And all of a sudden now I'm more open. So I see them together and there's that compersion that we're desiring. There's that joy for your, your the person that you love, I, ideally humanity, we can have joy for their joy. And that's what I was wanting to go for, but I had this hiccup way back, like early couple of years of, you know, first days in, in life, so to speak. And it took some rewiring and it took that leaning in that you're talking about, it took that curiosity and some expert facilitation to get on the other side of it. And now there's just freedom. You know, there can still be some sticky stuff that comes up in the communication and, and our agreements and, and stuff to work through, but... I'm recognizing that the lead weight that I've been carrying around this whole time and didn't realize I was carrying it around is now freed. Yeah, I noticed too in, in my relationship, and this was fairly recent, and I think I mentioned it one time on the podcast before, but I'll mention it again. You know, I had gotten my head straight around the metaphysical principles of compersion, right? Like two people experiencing love, experiencing joy should not cause me pain. Ultimately, other people are me living a different life. Like their pleasure should be my pleasure. Now, if someone's hurting somebody, well, that's a different story. Then I show up as protector and then, mm. you know, whatever goes from there, then the other animal instinct goes. But if someone is making someone I love happy and someone I love is making someone else happy, I should be happy, mm. <laughs> you know, like, so I got that principle. And I think my ego attached itself to, no, you got that. Like you totally got that, right? So I wouldn't allow myself to acknowledge that I wasn't feeling that, that I was right. feeling, I was feeling a little fucked up about it. <laughs> right. So instead of acknowledging that I started to kind of push Whitney away a little bit, like mm -hmm. make it seem like, uh, you know, 
I'm not in, you know, it's not that big a deal anyways. And I started to remove my emotional attachment so that the pain of loss and the fear would be diminished by me diminishing the importance of that relationship. And I saw myself kind of doing that. And I was like, oh shit. Like just because I had it right in my head didn't mean that I'd integrated it into my whole body. And I Mm -hmm. think that's an issue that a lot of us on this path can get. We can say, no, I got this. And then we judge ourselves according to having got it instead of recognizing like, yeah, I totally understand it. But for some reason, I'm still fucking it up. Totally. You know, that's such a good point, man. Um, The desire to be further ahead along the path than we are and bring it back to the gym. Like if I'm, if I'm in a training program, I know I could lift more or run fast or do X, Y, and Z. And I try and jump to that. There's going to be injury. Yeah. And it's the same thing in the emotional space. And it's a beautiful recognition on your part to see, to, to see, okay, I don't want to bypass to conversion, compassion, acceptance totally right off the bat because then all this other stuff isn't acknowledged that's totally valid. My anger, my jealousy, my insecurity, my fear, my sadness, my confusion, whatever it is. And there for me now kind of on the, uh, just th- through the, the treadmill of this last year, appreciating the connection that happens when I voice what's uncomfortable because mm-hmm. it, de- it draws in a deeper degree of intimacy and connection with whoever I'm sharing that with. If I'm sharing that with Sonia, my partner, or if I'm sharing that with her other partner, Gregory, I noticed that when I shared that with them individually and together, it brought all of us tighter. Yeah. It was super uncomfortable to, f- to feel that vulnerable, like with something that I can't write totally place. And because I typically don't... L- open up when I'm uncomfortable. I typically go into my cave and I want to look at it and I want to like get around it and I don't want to like bring somebody else in. So I wanted to do the leaning in part, which is like, I'm kind of uncomfortable and I don't know why. Mm-hmm. I want you guys to connect. I love you both. And I'm just having a hiccup. Mm-hmm. And it was just the voicing of that, that that allowed them to see my process so that I wasn't pushing them away and then making myself wrong for it. And I think that was the biggest thing that you also alluded to, is that I was making myself wrong for feeling a trigger about something that I thought I should have like gotten should over. Should have mastered that already. Jeez, you know, Because right? we hold ourselves to that criteria. <laughs> you know, like we're, we're gonna get it once in our head, and then right. we're gonna be able to apply it impeccably. Right. And it's just not the way that the human being works. And then the other trick, the other way that you divert, so one way is to lower the stakes in general, which is what I was doing. Like, pushing her away so that the stakes were lower. I had fewer insecurities because it didn't matter as much in my head. And that was, the other one is to get angry about little inconsequential details. And this is another area that I see happening with, that we've done and that I also see happening with other people trying, you know, an open container, or even any kind of non-traditional relationship. They'll say like, yeah, yeah, I'm okay with it. But you texted her three times in a single day and fuck that that's bullshit you know three times and, and they'll find something right like some totally trivial thing to pin their anger on yeah it because, gets displaced, displaced onto something onto else something else that isn't really the thing the thing is the thing but you'll find some little detail well you worded it this way instead of this way and that's another trap that mm-hmm. i think only when you're in the actual contest of this yeah. and only when you're really experiencing it do you are you aware like oh okay here's another yeah. way that i deflect because that energy pain. wants to move yeah like holding all that energy is going to be a pressure cooker and that thing's going to blow and spill over some way so then it comes in these covert ways or these passive aggressive ways all these ego defenses i'm going to deny it it's not there i'm mm. going to displace it it's oh it's, it's actually this thing <laughs> i'm going to be passive aggressive with it i'm going to kind of like push it and then i'm going to make it wrong for not being there yeah. you know i'm going to push it away and then i'm like where the fuck are you you know <laughs> you left They're like what are you pushing me away well I'll give me, you stood a sh-. i mean it's all this stuff right? right and there's the constant opportunity to get as clear as we can i think that's one of the things that the both the medicines help us with and also when we when we find expert facilitators in the realms of emotional intelligence that can help us track that kind of stuff yeah and if we're tracking it through our thoughts and our beliefs if we're tracking it through our hearts and how our, and how we're feeling sometimes if our hearts are offline maybe we're tracking in our body because now like oh my back is out mm-hmm. well yeah but is it really your back or is it your like lower kidneys, fear, early stuff coming out? Or maybe you have this heart pain, but it's reflexing to your shoulder because that's on the same meridian pathway. Yeah. 
So there's a variety of different ways it's going to come out. And then we get more and more facility with the willingness to lean in and stay in it. And that's what I think kind of keeps us in the ring because we know that the more we open ourselves up to what our authentic path is and opens not for everybody and and it can be for many people who don't realize that that's an option yeah because it goes against the norm and it's a little like tab well a lot of people you know and for those of you who are interested in kind of the earlier level discussions you can drop back into some of my old podcasts with whitney in the you know in the in the can already and kind of drop into this me and dan are kind of already jumping in in the, in the <laughs> yeah. middle of the water so if you're yeah. like what the fuck are they talking about aubrey lets people sleep with his fiance and dan has a <laughs> dan has a girl that has another boyfriend and a, with the husband like what yeah um you know you can drop into some of the older episodes but really you know we've both chosen to explore this non-traditional path because the traditional path didn't work for us mm. you know and we saw both our philosophical understandings about love in general about love not being in scarcity, about, you know, two people enjoying themselves not being something that should fundamentally cause anger, that I that metaphysical principle of all being the same, living different lives, all of these things kind of lined up, plus the natural inclination for variety and, and enjoyment and experience of multiple different people. I think we've all seen that that's the way. It doesn't mean that it's not hard, even for us doing the work to go through. So if you're interested in exploring that, you know, you got to understand that this is of really this is a process you know because we're having to go against a lot of cultural programming Mm -hmm. a lot of things that maybe instinctual programs Mm -hmm. from you know everybody can point to different animal models but our closest model is the bonobo right i mean that's who we share the most dna with and they're pretty good about everybody just kind of hooking up and being chill but we don't have to go too far down the line where we're back in the chimp model and it's the alpha beating, every, competitive. beating everybody up and keeping as mm-hmm. many you know mates as they possibly can. So we carry a little bit of all of that mm-hmm. DNA from the lion to the bonobo to everything. So there's some instinctual jealousy programming. There's some cultural jealousy programming. Familial. There's some familial jealousy programming. There's all of this stuff. But I think both you and I and a lot of other people in this space can attest that as that can be learned, it can be unlearned. Mm-hmm. And that genuinely you can experience a deeper closeness and a, you know, a far hotter, you know, more intense passion with your, with your partner, you know, if you're able to potentially unlearn Mm -hmm. some of this behavior and it is possible, but it's not easy. Not easy. No, it it adds into the system, higher degrees of complexity, complexity, um, time management, resource management, communication, agreements, tracking, Especially if you have multiple lovers, you're tracking their energetics. You're tracking them in relationship to potentially a primary partnership if you if you have that. And then what are the principles, <clears throat> what we call the, the maxims of our relationship? And that we have a very clear agreement field that the partnership in our relationship comes first. And then if we're onboarding others, then that's in the context of those others knowing that we're already in an existing partnership. Mm -hmm. and that ideally there is uh, some type of connection or at least an understanding of there being other energy shared with other people so that everybody's on board and um, up to speed. There's no surprises. Because last thing I want to do, I'm in for freedom and and as much internal freedom as I can experience in my heart, in my mind, in my body, in my spirit. And the last thing I want is higher degrees of drama. Right. and hurtness and right. dealing with stickiness and messiness and i would rather not opt into that kind of system or maybe opt in enough to understand how i've done it wrong in the past because i have done it wrong in the past when i just didn't know any better and that's kind of gotten us up to a level of proficiency that we're feeling pretty good at and even though you know, i was just having these, this conversation with you a few days ago even though I've done a fair bit of leaning in and a fair bit of medicine work and a fair bit of looking in the mirror and personal development work, and I've studied a variety of different psychology fields for a dozen years, there was still this really hard thing around commitment. Mm-hmm. And it's only been recent that I got on the other side of that. And I'm feeling like, okay, that lead weight now has been released. So there's always more to explore. 
And whether it's like in the ceremony or in relationship, those two for me have been the highest growth curves because they constantly show me where my my challenges are, where yeah. my weaknesses are, where my insecurities lie. Yeah. I think it's also something to know that this is going to be work. So if you're interested in exploring this, like be mindful of what else you have going on. Like, are you trying to sprint in your career? Well, maybe this isn't the time to explore open relationship because you're going to have to put in time, consciousness, effort, energy, because when your energy levels are depleted, everything is harder, mm. you know, like that matters. So if you're trying to sprint in your career, all right, maybe this is the time to explore that. If your health is a little shaky and you need to shore that up, I think it's too many times we try to do everything at once, mm -hmm. you know, and, and just be mindful that, yeah, you need to push against resistance for growth, but you can't push against resistance in every single category and expect to come out shining. So like carve out a little bit of bandwidth mm -hmm. that can do it. But the beauty of it is, you know, a lot of people think, oh, well, it just seems like so much more drama. And there is a lot of communication that's going to happen, a lot of emotions that come up. But I look at conventional relationships and there's oftentimes some of the most dramatic things I've ever seen ever, just kind of constant resentments mm -hmm. and fights. And, and the goal of this is to get to a conscious place where there are no withholds, there are no surprises, there are no secrets, everything is known. So it's not this constant, I'm wondering about this, I wonder if they want to hook up with this person, I, I don't know about this, they lied to me about that. That's where like the surprise drama hits you. Like yeah. when you get passed into this kind of everything is known then you don't have like the the surprise shit like guess what <laughs> you know nearly as often because you're you're communicating so well all the way through it kind of mm -hmm. curves the arc so it spreads the work out instead of just random chaos that can strike at any time yeah the the opportunity to do that level of work and mindfulness and managing the other aspects of your lives it, life and multiple lives is to, for me, the constant query and question is, am I being 100% authentic? Am I being fully authentic with myself? Am I being fully authentic in all my relationships? And that's when, that's where the term withholds comes up for me oftentimes. Like, what am I withholding? Whether it's a fear, a desire, a fantasy, um, some unmet need, maybe something that I've committed to in myself and I'm not having personal integrity because I've had this commitment to myself and I'm not following through. That's just easily as mirrored into my relationship or into my career or into like what other ecosystem or community I'm in the midst of. And there is the term radical honesty and the opportunity to just be completely um, present with whatever our truth is and speaking that at, um, at all costs, so to speak. And there's also the degree of skillfulness and mindfulness and how that gets shared the thing that about radical honesty is the thing that gets people fucked up is like someone's like well if you're radically honest what if someone's overweight well you'd be like oh you look so fat right now it's like they assume that you have to take a judgmental opinion mm -hmm. you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's like you don't have to be a judgy <laughs> schmuck you know like you can transcend the judgy aspect of that and see the person as whole maybe you recognize the challenges but it's you don't have to point those out. You know, it's not like liar, the liar, liar movie where every thought that comes through your head, <laughs> right. you have it to go automatic. Yeah. Automatic goes out. Mm -hmm. And it's also, it's also not, you have to be mindful of there's going to be crazy thought things that go through your mind that may not be really anchored. It may be your ego flashing up. It may not be something that you really genuinely feel, mm -hmm. you know? So like if you get this, I fucking hate you going through your head it doesn't mean you have to immediately go and say that thing it could be like whoa that was a strong reaction let's sit with that mm -hmm. and see if i really feel that where's that coming mm -hmm. from you know so people get terrified of this radical honesty idea and think that it's just going to turn into a disaster but it's not like every single single thought that goes through your head you voice you know because we don't even give our thoughts that much credit we have all kinds of crazy thoughts all the time throughout that the day change throughout that the change day right? a million times you know, so knowing that taking the time with your truth and also the fact that you don't have to be judgy and you don't have to share all of that other stuff, then, you know, kind of paints a, a more reasonable picture of what that radical honesty can be. Yeah. Yeah. And continuing to practice that authenticity with some humility and yeah. with kindness. Yeah. Because we can be honest and we can also be kind and recognize that if 
something that we were to share was going to be hurtful and it's not necessary is it is it is what i'm going to say useful and is it kind yeah and and if it doesn't meet on either of those then i typically am not sharing it and so i may be desiring to be authentic with my own inner dialogue about it like oh this person's kind of driving me crazy but it's not going to be useful or kind for me to share that with them for whatever reason yeah useful or kind i think is kind of both because sometimes the medicine is going to be a bitter herb oh you know yeah. sometimes you're going to have to call people out on their shit in the most loving way possible and, right and that's and what, let them know that's and that's what a real friend is and that, that's like the medicine as a real friend right yeah the, medic the medicines give us what we need i.e not what, what we ask for right not what we want from our egos what's going to be in our best good yeah not necessarily how we want it couched and how we want it served on us that's my favorite flag. line from muji baba who says you know if we were the chef of our life everything would be chocolate flavored but fortunately <laughs> there's a different chef and he serves you know up the hale and hearty bitter stews that we need right you know to to help us most help of the us be, most be of the medicines are bitters they are or most and most of the bitters are medicines yeah <laughs> interestingly interestingly mm -hmm. enough yeah the sweet satisfies you for a minute, but it ultimately isn't sustaining. You know, we need the combination of both mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting, you know, journey that we've gone on. And I think it's not only in relationships that we've taken that path, but it's, it's in, you know, rituals that I think, you know, one thing that I've been talking to you about is creating rituals, even with your friends, you know, areas where you can do something with your homies mm. that'll, kind of push the edge and and advance those relationships like oftentimes some of our best friends are those who we've gone through struggle with you know so a lot of us have our best friends from former sports teams we've been on or military platoons or you know other things but there's and we just don't spend the time cultivating other challenges that we can go through together so we don't form those kind of bonds that only form when two people are working you know together in the trenches in the trenches yeah. and so like medicine ceremony is one way but there's other ways too like go climb a cold mountain and fucking figure out how to pitch a tent and hang with your hang with your homies there mm -hmm. or like go do something that really you know stretches the edge and then you'll start to cultivate even better friendship bonds mm -hmm. and i think that's something that you know a lot of us don't pay attention to both for ourselves with our friends and with our lovers is just finding the ways to take relationships to the next level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, strengthening the the depth of that container in the relationship outside of the comfort zones into all of this unknown territory that you get to explore with one another. And we don't really know what people are about until they're stretched outside of, outside of their comfort zone. Yeah. <laughs> how do yeah. they sh how do they show up when the usual is no longer available? And um, now there's a, a, a deeper sense of maybe that primal nature, whether it's fear or greed or attachment or like ownership or jealousy, all of that kind of stuff comes out. Yeah. I remember I was doing a, I was doing a scuba diving cert and I was down there, um, down there with uh, one of my dad's, one of my dad's friends and we got paired off. And, uh, <laughs> and I remember I was, we were doing the buddy breathing exercise where you just, you know, you feign like you lost access to your regulator, mm -hmm. you lost access to your air supply, you're 40 feet under, and the instructor's right there, and the idea is that you share regulators so that you can each can breathe kind of off the same tank. You can each breathe off the same tank and then go to the surface. Mm -hmm. It's like an emergency procedure. That's why you always dive with a buddy. You don't know, yeah, right? And, uh, and so anyway, so we're going through, and, you know, I breathe, and then he breathes, and then I breathe, I go to put it in my mouth, and he just snatches that fucker <laughs> out of my mouth before I could even breathe. He just panicked, like, I've got no air. I'm gonna steal your shit. And I just, and I was calm. I'm pretty calm under the water. It's just something I'm really natural with. Mm -hmm. So I'm just looking at him, holding my breath, like, you motherfucker. <laughs> like, I see We're gonna true, have a conversation. I see, I see your true colors. <laughs> and I've up. never forgotten that. Like, I would, I'd never trust that guy. To right. be like in the foxhole, we'd have to like really do some work and be like, because I saw what happened. I saw when his air got questioned, yeah. he was just snatching for yeah. whatever I got. And I was from like, that, okay. From that place of panic. From that place of panic. Yeah. So that's where you like learn something about somebody and learn, because otherwise it can come up in a surprise. You know, like, 
oh shit, I wouldn't have expected you to turn on me like this because there was another female president who you were interested in. I wouldn't have expected you to completely betray me for your own self-interest. But if you're going through ritual with somebody, you might yeah. actually get to see some of that and yeah. see which of your friends are the ones that you can really count on and which are the ones that are going to steal your fucking regulator and, <laughs> and leave you to suffocate underwater. I don't know what happened to Aubrey. He was <laughs> yeah. just there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and they may not even know. No. It was, you know, it just, he didn't have that internal kind of strength mm -hmm. to, to do that. And I think that's what you try to train for in like SEAL training mm -hmm. and all of these things. Because that instinct. Continuously. The, that instinct for the Navy SEALs is death for the whole platoon. You know, if somebody right. wants to do that or any kind of, yeah. or the phalanx for the Spartans. Like you have that one guy that's just like, whoa, that's a lot. And he fuck takes his shield and runs. And then there's a big gap in your, in your whole yeah. operation. You know, you can't have that. Yeah. And there's, I don't know of a better way to train that than to give people the experience of being uh, reliant on one another out significantly outside of their comfort zone. Yeah. For long enough to be able to work through those instinctual patterns. And, and I think that was one of the, wasn't that the first reality show? Survive, Survivor? Survivor, yeah. Yeah. It's usually like what happens when people are freaked out and they're, all their survival instincts come online and how well do they think, how well can they problem solve, how well they, can they stay together? Is it just them or do they have to work in a team? It's a fascinating experiment. Well, and that had that other layer of it being kind of Lord of the Flies where like there could be only one winner. So everybody was like encouraged to be oh, backstabbing right. cunts yeah, to yeah. each other ultimately totally. at the end. But uh -huh. yeah, same you know, similar right. idea minus well, the competitive different. nature. Yeah, because that, that has a whole different energetic. Yeah. It's the chimp and the bonobo right. dialect. It's the competition versus the cooperative model. Mm -hmm. And we see that all systems that survive sustainably with longevity are cooperative systems not competitive systems competitive systems can survive in the short term but competitive systems don't survive in the long term because everything's dependent on everything else we've gotten to a point in our our apex as the dominant species but you could make the very clear argument that our degree of intellectual intelligence is not necessarily equating to our overall meta life intelligence because we as humans consistently make decisions against our own survival survival our, our cumulative survival right yeah and that's i think that kind of that instinct showing itself in macro like ultimately if we destroy our home then we die right <laughs> you know but in the, in the meantime and no other species does that right without thinking about their progeny their genetic code being passed on their continued species survival no other system in nature does that i'm not sure that that's true though right i mean i imagine some some species will just continue to rampantly overpopulate until they there are some controls in place but sometimes you know the species will just go on programming and overproduce itself to the detriment of the only ecosystem to, only to the extent that the natural environment allows for that population curve yeah so we have been able to like j we've jiggered it we've modified but, we're still, but the, the animals would still i mean i think i think we have the unique ability to and responsibility because we can jigger the system to create more room and to and to survive longer without relying on the ecosystem through agriculture through you know storage of resources and whatever we don't have to live like the plains indians mm -hmm. in harmony with the nature around us because the nature around us supports us but that also gives us makes us have the responsibility like we got to think of the long game you know we can't destroy the whole game board and expect to live as a species right and what's that quality of life going to be when 150 to 200 species die every day yeah. Go extinct every day. Those were the numbers a decade ago. I don't know what the numbers are now. Yeah. And in, I was just reading something about in Delhi right now, the air condition is so poor that it's like smoking 44 cigarettes a day, just walking around outside. That's not a sustainable system. Right. Losing as much of the rainforest as we do every day. I mean, so all these examples, the ocean is now 40% more acidic than it used to be. I can't help but think that one of the things that has really taken us down that unfortunate path is a lot of the unconsciousness around reproduction 
bringing it back to like the original you know entry point. because without like, with, relationship without like? environment you know kind of culling the amount of people that we can produce if we're not like conscious about like how many other humans we produce then the thing gets rampantly out of control and i think there's been a lot of rampant unconsciousness around sex and reproduction so that so many new humans are being birthed like whoops like that happened you know or you know not really looking at the whole and so you get these massive overpopulations that then even to survive require the mass consumption of resources agreed you know so it's it's a it's a momentum thing that's challenging that you know we're ultimately going to have to then now galvanize all of those people all of the people that we have to find solutions Mm -hmm. you know and use that solution but we really need to realign our goals and redistribute some of the priorities to like all right how do we prevent you know these disasters from happening how do we deflect a meteor that could kill all the planet how do we you know prevent the the decay of our ecosystem how do we clean the air quality how do we desalinize the water how do we keep the reefs in line like these should be global projects which an organization like the un should be championing but they're not they're worried about border disputes and whatever bureaucratic nonsense that's actually going on and i think that's the next step that we as humans have to take is like all right we're the ones who are now have the opportunity to either fuck this whole thing up or fix it and Mm -hmm. allow us to survive beyond the natural cataclysmic cycle that the earth goes in Mm -hmm. yeah it's one of the larger required conversations that doesn't happen very often which is around population management or population mindfulness or reproductive mindfulness conscious conception first time i ever kind of came across that that idea was in uh daniel quinn's book ishmael and there's this gorilla speaking about like from the gorillas highly intelligent gorillas speaking about how silly it is that humans consistently overpopulate every generation our population doubles and now it's starting to that that exponential growth curve is starting to start flatten out which is great and what is the the capacity and there's a lot of different numbers that suggest like we're already over capacity and there's other numbers that suggest oh we could we could still quadruple capacity and we could still grow enough food okay and what's still going to be the quality of life if we're living in such non-sustainable ways if we're throw if we're still such a consumer driven society and we're throwing so much stuff away yeah and we're not using fully what we have in front of us it's one of the reasons i like i like going back to peru and just living in uh not as an industrialized country and society you, you see resourcefulness come online where you know the car doesn't work anymore but now its motor's been like broken down and reutilized as yeah. a washing machine and, yeah, 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 <laughs> and yeah. a blender <laughs> and yeah. like some other thing there's just a massive amount of resourcefulness and i think of ultimately we'll get around it because necessity is the mother of invention but right now there's a lot that's happening that's threatening the soil and how we are able to propagate food and the water systems and the natural riverways where 99 rivers that were studied for contamination all came up positive for heavy metals and at least in california in the area that i'm living now it's very clear this is don't eat the fish that you catch in this river yeah and I'm, i'm just still kind of watching all of this play out in a relatively short time span. You know, just a few decades ago, we were not having these kind of conversations at this level of potential calamity. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, I I think, unfortunately, it will take more probably necessity as well as continued inspiration to really cause this shift. But ultimately, it, it has to be a consciousness that applies, you know, throughout everyone. You know, as, as long as we have this chimpanzee model of just, it as much as you can keep away the neighbors maintain dominance you know then we're not going to make it and it's not going to be it's not going to be led by the governments you know this is going to have to be a ground swelling movement where people are utilizing their resources willingly and communally and, and in communally. connection because yeah. we're built for that it's more yeah. fun when we get to do this together and when we get to share in a good way and when you said like we have these shared experiences that help grow the richness of being in human contact with one another 
So many of the diseases are right now diseases of excess because we have so much. We have so much food. We have so much time. So that's a whole nother discussion, but also diseases of isolation mm -hmm. where we, there's so much disconnect. There's a lot of connection through these like social media platforms, but that's not the same as human connection. And that has a very different look neurodevelopmentally in the psyche of the coming generation. The, the psychiatric conditions are on epidemic proportions rising in addiction. Opiate addiction is just massively spiraling out of control. Same thing with the numbers of addiction. I mean, uh, anxiety and depression. Yeah. Consistently going up, even with all the medications we have, the, su the suicides rate is, is higher now than it was before we ever even had medications, these, pharmace these psychiatric pharmaceuticals. So these, these experiences of connectivity have such a, a healing um, effect throughout all expressions of our life, how we live together, how we share resources, how we celebrate, how we get back in touch with the land, how we get back in touch with our spirits and like the zest for life. And most cultures that have less, less things actually experience a higher degree of happiness mm -hmm. because they're, they're, they're not ruled by their things and by the, man, the time management to make so much to keep their things working and online. And, and they're not as isolated. You know, exactly they're not as there's multiple people living in and out of the home you're connecting it all the time and even if it's a little dysfunctional a little fucked up like there's still people all around and Community. it's this cumulative effort and i think that's that has to be and i think that's one of both of our passions and one of the reasons why you're in the social experiment that you are i'm you know forging ahead in my own community social experiment because that ha the tribal concept can't be abandoned it has to be rejiggered reformed re-understood in a different way so that if every person had 50 people that they you know instead of saying mine all 50 said ours mm -hmm. and everybody had that then there wouldn't be these isolated lost cases that nobody was looking after like the circle would form and help those who were struggling and help those that were challenged and not only that but so forming the community but then having the tools to actually make significant change, which is the psychedelic medicine revolution that's coming. You know, the data that's coming out of these MDMA-assisted trials mm -hmm. and these psilocybin-assisted trials and the ayahuasca studies that are out and the aboga addiction studies and all of these medicines so that there'll be community and then there'll be actual tools to help both facilitate consciousness and to heal trauma. And then all of a sudden, when that starts to proliferate, and we got a real fucking fighting chance. Otherwise, mm -hmm. with the with the cards that are on the table, if you take those two things off, community and these radical paradigm shifting medicines that are going to be coming online, I don't think we have a chance. But with with those ideas, like a reimagining of of tribe and culture and community, and a rejiggering of the available options to heal the human operating system, I can still be hopeful and optimistic. Agreed. Yeah. And I, I, I like the, the model of distilling it down to those two primaries. Um, for me, I certainly have a yes in both of those camps because those are so fundamental. The, the desire to grow, to, to reach expanded states of consciousness, and the desire to connect, and how hardwired that is in both of those, how hardwired both of those are into our system. At, like where we come from. They're not hardwired so much into our cultural system right now. And yet this is the opportunity we have these kind of mediums and these kind of discussions to share this, this perspective and to also find the like-minded, like-hearted brothers and sisters on this path sharing that kind of message because we can start banding together and then it does become this grassroots movement. And mm -hmm. then that accelerates it because people recognize, oh, like... I would like to have more connection in my community too. Or, yeah, I haven't really expanded my own um, self beyond my comfort zones in a while or have done that with other people that I want to deepen my relationships with and deepen my connections with. So there's an inherent yes factor. And then the next question is, okay, how can I do that? Where can I go? What can I study? Who can I have that experience with? And this, I get a lot of these questions all the time. Um, I'd like to have an experience an expanded state experience, where can I go? How can I start? 
and then we just get down to the basics again. Okay, well, breathing. Breathing is always a great place to start. Cold yoga, right? Floating, <laughs> floating, right? Yeah. All of it, right? Just start with the basics. Solidify the foundation. Meditation. Mm-hmm. Be able to stick with yourself in the tank. Hold yourself together well enough so that you can prime the experience to go into the next level before you try and push it too far, like bypassing all of the earlier stages. And consistently, it's amazing that with the facilitated therapeutic experience of the medicines, and this isn't to say that it doesn't happen in in a recreational sense too, but particularly when it's therapeutic and facilitated, there is a sense of healing some degree of separation. Separation from myself, my true authentic self, separation from planet, parents, partners, friends and family, source, some degree of separation gets healed so that I already now feel more connected to who I am and more integrated as a whole person. And then now that more integrated self is now my cup is starting to fill back up. So I I naturally desire to have those experiences in all of the relationships that are around me. So then my life starts to change so that those are the kind of relationships I'm now opting for, yeah. I'm sorting for. One of the things that I've always appreciated about you is it, you're not a, in that black and white absolutism, all or nothing kind of camp. I mean, you're an MD psychiatrist and you look at all of the tools that we have on the table. All right, here's pharmaceutical intervention options. Here's the consciousness expansion options. Here's the nutritional deficiency and health optimization options. Here's the supplemental options. Here's the community practice options. And you don't need to go radical, you know, and say like, well, fuck, if I'm going to meditate, I got to get off all my meds. I got to do all the, I got to stop eating all the sugar and I, it's just too much. I can't even do it. So I do nothing, Mm. you know, like you can make incremental gains. You can pace yourself, you know, you can still use pharmaceutical intervention and some of those tools while you're building up the resources of community and resources mm-hmm. of your consciousness practices and all of these other things so that eventually that gets strong enough in your nu- nutritional base and everything that maybe then you can start to drop off some of the pharmaceutical interventions when you're ready mm-hmm. you know and then if shit gets crazy you know and you need that help again okay here are the options you know but doing it consciously rather than saying oh you're depressed just take this pill don't worry about it you know like that's not going to work You know, ultimately that's using just the Band-Aid over and over again for a massive wound that's just bleeding out. Like you got to do the healing, use the Band-Aid too, that's fine. You can apply that, but also do the the core healing practices Mm -hmm. at the same time. But I think too many people think in these black and white categories, and it's not that. Like we have all the tools, let's use them. Again, just like I said earlier about don't maybe sprint in your career, sprint in your relationships, sprint in your community, sprint in everything. At the same time, pick the areas where you're advancing and then allow some time for the rest of the mm. stuff to grow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, slow change is lasting change. These big overarching, and I've done that so, so many times in the past where I've yeah. tried to make these massive <laughs> leaps because I know it's possible. And I get so excited about what's possible. I don't want to try and get there as fast as I can, but maybe I'm doing that in multiple areas. And I might be spreading myself thin. I might be trying to overstep or bypass earlier work that just needs to happen. We were talking about this Trevor Hall song, You Can't Rush Your Healing. Yeah. You know, I can't f- force that flower within me to open. And yet I can still give it the right nu- n- nutrients, nourishment, water, sunlight, care, rest, start with the basics and be willing to be uncomfortable through the changes because that's what's going to be necessary. We get stuck in our comfort zones and it's uncomfortable to change. Like if I'm addicted to sugar, it's going to be uncomfortable to start gradually letting that go Mm -hmm. if sugar is massively affecting my weight, affecting my hormones, affecting my neurochemistry, affecting my digestion. Cancel clear, it doesn't do those things with me anymore. I didn't realize I had a sugar addiction until I went through an aboga journey and I was like, whoa. Yeah. That thing was there. I mean, I've already, I'd already been in addiction, uh, in and out of addictive cycles with alcohol and marijuana, and then it was sugar. But sugar is just a, such insidious one because it's like in everything. Yeah. And then once it wasn't there, I was like, whoa, that's not even there anymore. And 
And yet there are a lot of those different kind of patterns that we get in. So if we recognize, and this is where it takes a real kind of like from an AA term, honest inventory. Like we can ask ourselves honestly, what are the patterns that I'm really ready to let go of? Because they're, they've been, maybe they've been keeping me safe, right? So I, I've had a challenge with commitment for a long time. And that kept me safe through a lot of my early years, but it also kept me in a shell. Mm -hmm. So then to like start to open up that heart again, that was the big prayer, like open this heart. Well, then I, <laughs> I didn't realize it was going to feel like it got smashed by Thor's hammer <laughs> repeatedly in order to, ho to open. But sometimes the hard nuts need big hammers. Yeah. So be careful what we ask for and be willing to stretch ourselves beyond our comfort zones because that's where the magic happens. Like the comfort's here, safety's here, but the magic happens over here. Yeah. And also, you know, talking about your own flower that way, I think too many of us, if we do have these transformative experiences and we're with somebody who maybe wasn't along with us in that journey, everybody's at their own pace. You may have that impetus to try and force open their flower. Like, hey, you got to get where I'm at right now and, and do it now. Take these medicines, do these things. Like, you got to get there. And we start, you know, wanting to force and compel the action. I've certainly been guilty of that. Mm -hmm. Whereas that's never the way. You know, it's just that kind of steady, you know, these are the, these are the options, but everybody has to walk themselves to their own water trough. Like mm -hmm. you can't drag somebody and expect them to just drink from the fire hose and, and change. They got to do it of their own volition. It's like this universal law. Yeah. You got, it is you got our to, work to do. You got to choose your own path. You got to do it for you. You got to want to do it. And, you know, so if you're with some, you know, your significant other and you want them on that, you know, show them that option, love them through it and be ready for them to take their own pace. And if it isn't something that's working, it isn't working, but you can, you can never force anybody down that path. Mm -hmm. It has to be something that they want to engage in. So you have to have patience. Patience. And like, uh, St. Francis says, share the gospel with everybody and when necessary, use words. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, just being that. And it's challenging when there are partners or our parents or our kids, you know, because we have a, you know, we have attachment there to be so patient. Um, but that's the real work. It's like, yeah. I, I love you. I see you where you're at. I see you in your brilliance. I see where you could grow. And that might just be my perception. I want to love you here now in this moment, yeah. in this self at this time. It also reminds me, you know, the people who are using words rather than the embodiment of the change they want, those are, that's probably the hardest people for me to be around. You know, and it's like, it reminds me of the saying, like, the hardest place to find a true Christian is in church. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, when you really understand those principles that Yeshua was teaching at the core metaphysical level, and then what the religiosity has done, you know, with the uh, you're going to hell and all the judgment and all of these different programs that have run in traditional churches. And I'm not saying it's your church, but I'm just saying in general, you know, that's a different story and that can happen in spirituality as well. You know, you can have someone judgmentally talking about non-judgment, you know what I mean? And it's the funniest thing and they won't even recognize that principle. It's that spiritual materialism like, oh yeah, they're just not awake yet and blah, blah, blah. You know, they're so and it's so judgmental how they're expressing this idea which is ultimately about non-judgment and it's just not even registering it's the same you know you can get stuck in all those traps so really embodying it first speaking last is the way mm -hmm. yeah it's such a practice yeah. i've had experience too a couple of times where i i, I met people who describe themselves as atheists and yet when I heard their principles and the way they live their lives and the way they treat other people, I'm like, you feel like one of the more spiritually intact, connected people right. I know. Right. <laughs> so it's, the, it's an idea of a persona that we identify ourselves with. I am this, I am that, versus just being who we are and living the principles and values that feel the most life-affirming. Like it feels good when I'm in resonance with somebody that... We're sharing ideas and vision and experiences together and we're playing and we're growing and maybe we're sharing those challenges too and it gets deeper and more rich. Like that's a yes factor. And I just want whatever that is. And so I eat meat now and I didn't, I was raw vegan for like five years and 
I was in a dogma at that time. I wanted to study it, so I was in, a, in, a, in an experiment. But I, I was in a bit of a dogma because I was doing it so that I could become something in my mind that I thought I needed to become, and it was weakening my body over time. And so it did open up my heart. It did help me get more spiritually connected. And yet it was at the expense of my body that when I first had my first egg after five years, I had this like whole body orgasm, <laughs> just, like laying on the Cholesterol, kitchen floor. Cholesterol, thank God. Please, thank you. <laughs> Where have you been? And it was one of the, and I didn't realize until that moment, like, wow, I've been in a dogma. Yeah. I've been in a complete identified person, persona, persona that I was projecting both internally and externally. And so there's just been these gradual like peeling backs of like whoever I think I need to be, maybe I'll just rest, rest my mind about what that thought needs to be and just follow the, the experience in the moment of what feels right and what feels like it's life affirming and, and orienting me towards a vision for my life to have excellence as best I can in all areas. Mm. Yeah, I, I think when you're looking at that, it's, you know, especially with others, I think we lose compassion for the the right to be better than somebody you know what i mean like it feels good to our ego to be better than another individual we like the separation mm. like we like the fact that if you can be vegan and someone's eating meat and you can be have some kind of superior high ground and be like oh, fucking meat eater savage mm. Mm. you know what i mean and then that'll keep us subtly in this or even with spirituality with any of these things religion nation state color race class whatever it is you know we like the ego likes that feeling of superiority but then the heart really only sees compassion and joy for the other person's joy you know and so recognizing how much that some part of us likes separation and then you know it's something we do all the time with our with our friend group you know we may have a pretty tight group of 10 friends but five of them will pair off and they'll spend the first hour and a half of dinner over wine talking shit about the other five and then you rejigger the five and those five talk shit about the other five and you rejigger the five and those five talk shit about the other five and pretty soon it just undermines the whole system yeah. you know because everybody is kind of trying to separate from everybody else rather than trying to pull together mm-hmm. and that's those are the fundamental things about community that need to need to exist. You know, you can recognize where people have work and whatever, but not approach it not from judgment, but like, all right, how can we show up to help bring that person through the other side mm-hmm. rather than how can we bond together by pointing out that other person's mm-hmm. different and making us mm-hmm. superior, you know? Yeah, we're, we're all just made up of the same cosmic dust, desiring the same experiences of joy, happiness, connection. And I've been noodling over this, this line in this book I read recently. Essentially, it's become a mantra and a prayer of mine. Whatever I want for myself, I want for everybody. And it was such a big statement. I had to mm-hmm. put the book down and just kind of like ponder that for a couple of hours. Like where, I mean, because that feels so affirming. And if it doesn't feel affirming, then why not? Yeah. What what has been is there anything in the background that would tell me that I don't want that to be true? And if not, why not? And is the is the world and the universe abundant enough? And do I choose it to see do I choose to see it as abundant enough that whatever I want for myself, I want for everybody? And if that was able to happen, what would life become? Yeah. And what's interesting there is somebody will say, well, why don't you just give all your money away then, bro? Because part of what you want for somebody is for them to also earn it. Mm -hmm. Because that was part of what you went through as well, is you bought your resistance, you forged ahead, you earned it. It's not about distributing just the fruit. It's distributing the picking of the fruit. Right. Don't, give a, don't just give a man a fish, teach him how to fish. Exactly. And that's the, I think that's the thing that people can't wrap their head around. Yes, certainly share the end product, but just dropping the end product on somebody isn't sharing the mm-hmm. same thing that we're talking. It's not wanting the same thing for everybody that you got. It's showing them how to take that process to acquire resources, to be able to share resources themselves, not just be on the receiving end of the teat, constantly having other people 
supply stuff for you. Mm -hmm. That is not a satisfying life. That mm -hmm. is not something that fortifies the soul. That's not something that allows you to expand to the higher levels. So you have to be cognizant that it's not just sharing the end product, it's sharing the process. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's really important. And you can rob someone of the process by making it too easy. Totally. You know, for you sure. can do that for your kids. I mean, you can do that for your lovers. Mm -hmm. If you make it so easy on your kids, you know, then they're not going to learn the process that made you who you are. It's a balance of, yes, you want to provide them with the, the tool, with the resources to live a good life, but you also need to deny them some of the luxuries and spoils that they haven't earned or they're not going to go through the process mm -hmm. to earn that. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with all people. You know, I've seen that disruption on the ground when I went to Africa. You know, I saw how the massive amounts of aid that was coming in from the West was taking the most entrepreneurial minded, the most innovative thinking Africans, and they were writing grants instead of starting businesses and start a, instead of trying mm. to work within the system to, you know, create sustainable, you know, e economic ecosystems. They were like, oh, well, if I apply my ingenuity towards grant money then mm -hmm. i can siphon the grant money and i can apply some creative accounting and i can actually get super rich that way and that's easier so you have to be careful in just giving massive amounts that you don't disrupt the natural process yeah. that's ultimately going to be the most healthy yeah how do we teach ourselves and others the the experience of resilience and responsibility and there that's a dance yeah you know how do we do that in, in a good way and um, there, I, I oftentimes, particularly in our conversations, I come back to Aldous Huxley's The Island. Yeah. <laughs> and the experiences where we're growing our community, our connection with each other outside of our comfort zones, up the mountain. Mm -hmm. And then we're growing and expanding our consciousness together on the mountain, in the lodge, in the maloka, you know, some kind of ceremony, some kind of place where we get to face our shadows face our limitations face those fears within ourselves because the fear is the thing that's going to cause the contraction yeah. it's going to it's going to cause the thing that's going to make me energetically or even physically start doing this and then when or like you know i'm 40 feet down and i got to share a regulator with you i'm gonna make sure i got all my breath first <laughs> <laughs> here you know yeah totally here i was uh Last night I got a call, middle of the night, um, not quite middle of the night, but right before I was going to bed, you know, past midnight, from a very close friend, and that friend was going through a really hard time in the kind of romantic, in the romantic way, you know, her, her lover was seeing another lover, and she just found out she's been out of town, and they had a, a loose open, you know, open container, so it was kind of, it was allowed, but it was a total surprise, mm -hmm. and so she was just waves of these emotions that she were just overwhelming you know were kind of coming over and as i was talking to her and i've had experience with those things that i was talking to her and this is just something i wanted to share with the audience the first thing i think to do is when you find yourself with overwhelming fear or overwhelming emotions and it just seems like too much is the tool that i like and i'm interested you know what you might have to say about this but the tool i like is to first shift perspective and i had a really cool experience Friday night when I was hosting an ecstatic dance where, you know, I dropped into trance and I dropped in from the perspective of my universal being, my eternal being, mm -hmm. you know, this concept of the, the consciousness that will exist past this life and saw myself engaging in this life like I was painting a sand garden with my hands and painting different shapes and colors like a sand mandala and making my life and the others around it and, and making this art, but ultimately the wind and time would wash all of those marks, no matter how deep I ran my fingers through the sand, you know, it would all go. And it made it seem like, oh yes, this is, this is play, mm. you know, and in the perspective of time, this isn't such a big deal. Mm. Whatever you're going through, whatever challenge you're in right now, this is just one of the squiggly lines in your ultimate life sand mandala <laughs> that you're painting. And it just allows like a little bit of, breathing room mm -hmm. you know because sometimes the shit can come so hard so heavy so fast it's just overwhelming so and that seemed to be effective for her to just give her the breathing room where she could stop mm -hmm. the the tears and the hiccuping and the like sheer you know 
everything that was just overwhelming mm -hmm. you know so what when you find somebody in that you know do you use like a, a similar mechanism when someone's just overwhelmed or what would you say for people who just feel overwhelmed in the moment mm -hmm. yeah it's i appreciate you bringing it up because it's such a real world example i think one that everybody can relate to like all of a sudden now i'm just in this fritz out like I, mm -hmm. I see my I see my internal like emotional system as a circuit board, and like all of a sudden fuses are blo fuses are blowing, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's exactly. shutting down, powering down. That's what it's like for me. Oftentimes, externally it'll look like a powering down, but internally I might be raging. I might be like super confused. I might be like, "What the fuck just happened?" And so there's something that's happening in the system, and my and I'll, so I can answer that question in a couple of different ways because. What, one thing that I'm recognizing that's helpful for me is doing what your friend did, which is reaching out to you. Right. Reaching out to a trusted, confident companion. Good call. Mentor, therapist, somebody that's, that is able to give not only support, at minimum you need support. Ideally it's both support and counsel. Mm -hmm. You know, some kind of wise counsel. And that means that that person's probably been through it before. Because we can only help people as far as we've gone. Otherwise, it's like mutual exploration. Yeah, and at that point, the the ability to reach out helps to already give the separation because that person's now going to work as like kind of an auxiliary ego. Mm. Like maybe it was like this, and maybe you're actually going through something like this. And it's and by the way, it's all fucking okay because you're great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're perfect. You're beautiful. So there's already now like a sense of validation, and that that is so hard for us to do to ourselves and by ourselves in the moment because the the thing is so fritzy it's like consuming all of our awareness and maybe we have some programming where i don't want to burden anybody with my trouble nobody wants to talk to me right now i'm not right. worthy of reaching out i'm not worthy of their right. counsel or friendship and that could be that could be a huge self-worth piece for me it was a safety piece i don't trust anybody mm. and i didn't really get around that till like i said just a few weeks ago and that's this whole thing around commitment I've only ever really at the core trusted the plants. That's why it was so <laughs> They're steady. Right. They're just pure <laughs> consciousness. I, there's no ego. There's no traps. There's nothing going in. They're going to be consistent. Yeah. And so now my practice is to actually work what's not built in as conscious competence. Right. So I'm choosing to opt in to connection and saying what's uncomfortable. Because I know that level of connectivity will help, and yet there might be a wall previously that wouldn't even allow it. Like that might, be, that, that might help, but I'm, I'm gonna hold on to my righteous indignation, like I deserve this pain, <laughs> yeah. and you can't change it, yeah. and I'm gonna hold it. It might be helpful for me to do that thing, but just because you suggested it, I'm not even gonna do it. I'm gonna do this thing right here, and you're gonna, you're gonna be able to change, like all right, whatever it is. And so now the practice is to go into the opposite, like lean in, to do what I know is gonna be helpful, lean in, make contact. If I'm by myself, then it, it's, I need to be able to train some kind of auxiliary behavior that gives me a pattern interrupt. Go for a walk. Go for, it could be go for a walk, could be just dropping into breath and some breathing practice. Cause I know if I do five minutes of breathing in the midst of like a circuit board overload, I'm gonna be a lot better off yep. at the end of that five minutes. Yeah, change your state. Ch some kind of state change. Um, and it could, be, it could be an internal mantra, like um, whatever this is, is happening for me and not to me. A change from fear to faith. Like ultimately, if I believe that the universe is benevolent and everything is supporting my evolutionary path growing forward to becoming more of who I can be, who I choose to be, if it's helping me, especially when I don't see it, because in retrospect, I can see like, oh yeah, that time I broke my neck, that did this thing for me. Mm -hmm. That time where I got divorced and like, you know, lived in the, you know, wherever for doing whatever, like whatever the thing is. I can look back and I can say, okay, that helped me in this way, then everything is helping me in this way, especially this right now. So if I've got some kind of internal mantra or ethos that helps me track that in the moment, then at that point, I gain power back. It's that classic thing that I talk about of having um, hindsight as foresight. Because in hindsight, we're mm. often grateful mm. for these challenges. Mm -hmm. But with foresight, it looks like a disaster.
looks like this is the end. Right. This is where I get fucked this up. This thing this is, is now I got all these things that I think are going to happen as a result. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's, uh, it's like a muscle, mm-hmm. you know, training that thing. Like the experiences I am presently going for are necessary for the evolution of my consciousness, yeah. myself. And the more it gets trained, it moves from that unconscious incompetence to unconscious competence. Like, I don't have to think about it to do it anymore. It becomes my new habit. Yeah. And, and that's a stage. You know, we just practice, practice, practice until it gets to that point. Yeah. Yeah, and then also being stepping outside and observing yourself in the moment, too, having that other perspective of like, oh, look, the Aubrey is freaking the fuck out right now. <laughs> the Aubrey. The Aubrey is going mad. He's so angry. <laughs> I hear Corey speaking yeah. from that perspective. I right. Love that. Yeah. Like the Aubrey is raging. <laughs> the Aubrey is a raising, raging chimpanzee right now. Like yeah. maybe the Aubrey should calm down. <laughs> you know, and when you hear yourself raising your voice or getting all worked up or, you know, like maybe, you know, you have that practice where you can be like, whoa, 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 buddy. Whoa. What's going what on just here? But that's there? hard because yeah. the emotions will want to take you right along that. Yeah. Just drag you by the nuts and just take it with you. Right. Straight into the heart of your pain. Totally. But if you can separate and have that little perspective, either through, you know, expanding the amount of time or creating separation between your consciousness and the emotions that are going or doing that, I think those are a lot of powerful tools. But mm-hmm. But you're right that reaching out to somebody is really key but it's also a lot of people like you said don't have those people that they can trust which then goes again back to community because if sometimes you can reach out to somebody and if they're in the same similar conscious and they're in the same similar traps that you're in they'll be like oh yeah fuck that person that and they'll just fucking rev it up it'll be like i got this fire burning and it's killing me and they're like Oh yeah, you want some more coal? Here you go. <laughs> I got <Right>. some gas. <laughs> Will that work? <laughs> like, let's get really I'm going to feel better as we fire that up together because yeah. I've been alone in my pain, and now you're reaching out to me in your pain, and I got the same pain. So I'm going to help mirror your pain so we can be in it together because I don't want to be in my pain alone. Yeah, which kind of works on the basest, lowest level because at least you have some kind of camaraderie, but it's ultimately not going to help either of you transcend it, right? You know, and that's what you. I mean, I think that is the first instinct. Like, let's go get fucking shit faced with the other person that's in the most pain possible, and then let's just revel in it. And you know, you can use that. You can use that tool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if we, you use, have we to. use crutches along <laughs> yeah. the way as needed. <laughs> yeah. Well, brother, this has been awesome, man. I'm uh, excited to see your constant evolution. I know uh, you just dropped an on it podcast with Kyle talking about the concussion repair manual, which is a whole subject that i'll leave for that podcast but anybody who's ever gotten hit in the head which is uh pretty much everybody um please check out the podcast with kyle on on a podcast about the concussion repair manual check out your book it's available on amazon as an ebook and as a uh soft cover right yep and um you're developing some other things full spectrum medicine coming online a few other projects but uh look forward to seeing what the next evolution will bring brother yes indeed it's always good it's always a pleasure to drop in with you on on these shares too, because I I don't ever know what's going to happen. Magic yeah. always happens, and it's these little benchmarks too along our path that we kind of share. Like you know, we've been doing this for a number of years now, and uh, it reminds me of how much can happen in a relatively short period of time since we did speak last last in this kind of context. Yeah, no doubt. Well, thank you everybody. Follow this man, Dr. Dan Engel. He's got the socials. He doesn't go on him that much, but uh, he drops he drops stuff all the time. So keep up with him. And I love you, and I'll talk to you soon. Peace. Peace.